So now we've started talking about the moment of inertia. Recall that the moment of inertia, as we calculate, depends on r. Where this r is measured from the rotational axis. So even though you may not know how to take an integral, just know that the calculation involves for each individual point, say that point, an r that is measured from the rotational axis. So hopefully you can appreciate that if we spin this rod here, instead of at that point, but maybe at that point, we would expect to get a different moment of inertia because now the r is different. But the table that we're usually given doesn't specifically tell you the moment of inertia at every single possible axis. You know, for each shape here, it really only gives you one or two axes that goes through particular points. And so we can't directly look up the answer to this question because the axis, even though it is a thin rod, right, it's over here, the axis of rotation is not through the middle and not through the end, so it's neither of these. Thankfully though, mathematically, we can break down this sum or integral over here into things that we can look up. And that's what we call the parallel axis theorem. If we call this rotational axis A at any point along the object, or even off the object, that's totally possible, the moment of inertia about this axis A, it's related to, if you have the center of mass here, the axis through the center of mass of this object, that's parallel. Notice how these things are parallel. That's why the parallel axis theorem. We can shift this result going through the center of mass to our new axis that we want by m delta r squared. This thing through the center of mass, that's what we look up on the table. Right? It's because of the parallel axis theorem that the tables are constructed to have most of these given ones through the center of mass. You can see that right here, it goes right through the middle. It is very critical that you must start with the moment inertia that goes through the center of mass. Otherwise the whole math breaks down. So that's why this one is particularly pesky because it's given on an axis that doesn't go through the center. In fact, you can get this result by starting at the center and using the parallel axis theorem. And you can check that out for yourself. So we will be using this one because it is a thin rod right through the center here. So we know ICM, if you go back to the table, is 1 half ML squared, L being the entire length of the rod. To use the parallel axis theorem, we also need this delta R, right, delta R. And so this distance, if we measure from the end here, this is 1 half L subtracted 1 six L. I know you guys have all these fancy calculator to do fractional addition and subtraction, but I'm a bit more old school and I like to do the common denominator thing, which is three minus one. So that's two six L, which is one third L. So then we can use the parallel axis theorem to basically shift the axis in a way. We have the center of mass, moment of inertia, plus m delta r squared. So then we have common factors of ml squared on both terms, and then you have a 12 plus 1 third squared, that's a 9. So that's equal to, let's use 36 as our common denominator, which gives us 7 over 36 ml squared. And there you go the parallel axis theorem, so that we don't have to have tables of every single point along the body. We can just use this to calculate, given the center of mass, moments of inertia. One last quick thing to note is if you look at the parallel axis theorem itself, you're adding an mr square thing. So this mr square term is always positive, meaning that the moment of inertia at any other point other than the center of mass will be bigger than that at the center of mass. Intuitively, that's kind of saying that it's the easiest to spin something 
around its center. Once you're off center, it kind of feels heavier, and that's kind of the feeling of the increase of your moment of inertia.